a warm welcome to you, Tule. Great to have you here, and uh, really uh, fascinating to be to be able to listen to you today. So, welcome. Thank you, everyone, and hello, hello, <laughs> everyone. When we talk about the EA Inclusive Design Framework, um, one thing. <laughs> or the reason why we essentially came up with this is because we wanted to improve and diversify the um, range of characters we are showing in our games. So it's not always uh, white male uh, developers um, making games that reflect who they are or who their teams look like, but um, reflecting um, the world we live in and the diversity of range of players who are going to enjoy our games because we want uh, all gamers to engage with our games in a positive, fun uh, and safe way. And uh, there's also a connection with the uh, topic of um, uh, toxicity we can uh, experience as a minority in, in some of the games, which also deter us from playing, such as um, racism uh, in chat, for example, or sexism, homophobia. All of that can get uh, in the way of positive play. So at EA, we have um, an initiative that we call positive play to really tackle all of that. And the inclusion framework or inclusive design framework plugs into that um, positive play umbrella. And it is really important to us to um, make sure that all of our games are inclusive and welcome to all players because excluded or being excluded or feeling excluded um, in real life uh, is not fun, uh, let alone when you play a game where um, you're playing it to have fun and escape uh, maybe the uh, reality you live in um, and then you experience that again. And um, so that's essentially what the talk is about. I know sometimes uh, inclusive design or um, gets in confused with inclusion or in um, um, accessibility related um, um, topics. So this is also uh, addressing representation of uh, disabilities and um, uh, making sure that no mechanic or design excludes players, but um, it's mostly more focused on the representation, cultural sensitivity and everything. So that's an introduction to the topic. Um, the introduction to me, like who am I and um, why am I talking to you about this? Um, as uh, Patrick said, I'm uh, my name is Tula Tetika McNally. So as you can see, I'm not uh, uh, Irish or Scottish, uh, despite my McNally name, but I'm originally um, uh, yeah. Turkish uh, born uh, and raised in Germany. Uh, I studied American cultural history uh, and psychology and uh, graduated with a master's degree in 2003 from the um, University in Munich. And then I pretty much uh, left uh, the country and started working as a journalist in um, and a, a community manager, I guess, for 3D art. So I got more into the uh, post-production computer graphics side and um, 2006, I started working in the games industry in localization, uh, look uh, testing, um, and I ended up fast forward working for companies like uh, Square Enix uh, and Sega in the UK, and um, um, also a Mont in Montreal for two years, and um, moved to BioWare in 2008. Uh, no, sorry, to my, that was my husband. <laughs> I moved there in 2010. Um, and uh, I was heading up the quality assurance uh, department and quality engineering across Edmonton, Montreal, and then Austin, and uh, worked on some games like um, Tail End of Mass Effect 2, um, Dragon Age Inquisition. Dragon Age 2 was my first game at BioWare. Um, Mass Effect 3, um, and then parts, well, for the whole cycle of Mass Effect Andromeda, and then parts of... Um, Anthem as well. And um, so as, as you know, Bioware games, they are um, quite diverse and inclusive, uh, especially games like Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, and when I came to DICE uh, two years ago, uh, I realized that um, what I thought was just um, normal and given that you do this um, 
because we had a lot more diversity in our writing team as well, especially for Inquisition. We had um, almost 50-50 female, male. Uh, and um, we had also a lot of um, writers. I mean, our lead writer were, was um, himself from the LGBTQ com community. Um, but that vibe was just like not the same when I when I came here. And, um, and I realized that there are more teams like that where they need maybe a bit more help and encouragement uh, and education to help them understand why um, these things are important to our players uh, and that we are making games for our players and not for ourselves. Um, and how maybe even just asking simple questions can um, help them make a better experience for our players. And uh, as an anecdote, because I have these two pictures here with FemShep and uh, Inquisition, is, um, one of the things as you embark on your career uh, in games that I can absolutely recommend to you is try to connect with the people who you make the games for. Because for me, when I went to a conference called uh, PAX Prime uh, in Seattle in 2013, I think, and we went there to um, reveal uh, the Dragon Age Inquisition launch trader and we had uh, panels with our fans um, and I was in one panel where um, there were literally a bunch of people lining up because they wanted to talk to us and tell us how much Inquisition um, changed their lives or um, you know there were people who were dealing with um, severe trauma um, suicidal thoughts or um, issues where one person was, for example, from a very uh, orthodox Jewish uh, household, but the person was an atheist and they had really a conflicting relationship with their parents and they didn't know how to kind of work through this. But Inquisition and some of the themes in the game really helped them work through this. So it was um, when, when we say that games... We are, you know, I heard some people say, like, we are just making toys. We are not brain surgeons. I think sometimes we really underestimate how much of an impact these games can have on people's lives, um, on dealing with, um, you know, serious issues or even just like distressing um, or even how meaningful it can be when you are a minority, like a taxi driver I met uh, in Florida who said he was from the, the Caribbean um, and he said, can you make, so you work for electronic arts, can you make games where there are more people who look like me? And I thought, yeah, why don't we do that anyway? And 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 so that's kind of what got me really interested in this topic to pursue more. Um, how can we help developers educate them um, and help them just think about this topic uh, a bit more? So... What do I mean exactly by uh, inclusive design? So what you see on the graph here is what uh, we call um, diversity dimensions, because when we talk about diversity or inclusion, often people immediately think about um, topics like accessibility, or they think about ah, uh, gender and ethnicity, which we talked about right at the beginning. But there are also other themes like um, you know, um, religion, sexuality, um, age. Um, when you look at games, often um, the heroes are probably in their 20s, maybe teenagers. Um, there are not a lot of heroes uh, who are in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, for example, or, or they're just like background characters um, or quest givers in RPGs. Um, culture and customs, uh, when, you know, sometimes we're looking at things from a very Western lens, or when you look at JRPGs, they are made from a very um, Asian lens, um, sometimes not always appealing to everyone, or uh, games developed in America, maybe with Japanese themes, are looked at from an American lens. Um, and I'll give you some examples how we work through this uh, at the end on Battlefield. So being aware that um, when you make a game, um, that you should be collecting feedback as you are going along the journey. And you can do your research online about, hey, I want to set the game in Japan, and then you can go on Wikipedia or um, other websites to do your research. But nothing really goes over 
actually interacting with people from the communities to make this a really um, authentic uh, experience um, to include um, diversity of thought, culture, lifestyle, age, religion, and language. Um, because by talking to people who are from those communities, you will get a much richer experience instead of just doing research on the internet. Why diversity and inclusion is also important is because it really helps uh, with the whole sense of belonging. So you don't feel isolated and different and other, especially if you're part of um, if a, a minority. Uh, and it helps those minorities also feel more valued, having an active voice at the table, respected and heard. Um, and yeah, I think... I would like to move on to a bit more context when we talk about um, diversity and inclusion, a bit of background in terms of uh, or this is when I say we want authentic experiences is to be aware of your own um, biases, uh, maybe of your own uh, stereotypes uh, as well. Because what we don't want is when we are telling stories um, about different uh, people from different backgrounds, we don't want them to look like a caricature. We want them to feel uh, authentic. So one thing that is really important with this topic is really show empathy with our players um, because it can lead to a lot more uh, holistic uh, creativity and innovation. And our players can uh, benefit from um, that empathy just as much as our employees, because um, maybe you follow the news, but there's a lot of uh, training um, and awareness going on with a lot of corporations as well on this topic, so which is really great to see. Um, and to understand the um, players and the challenges you may be facing when you ha work as a team or you have a team is, um, to look at the definitions of empathy. Um, some of those uh, definitions are, for example, try to see the world as another person would see it, um, or um, try to understand the person's feelings. And realistically, you will never really um, understand like what the person goes through. Um, but what you can do is really putting your own perceptions and experience aside and just like truly tune in and listen to what someone else is saying and suspend your judgment and um, active listening is probably one of the uh, biggest skills um, you can apply to this. Um, when we make games, one point I'm trying to drive home um, a lot um, with the teams I'm working with is that these things need to happen early on in the game. Because essentially, if you break down a game simplified into a product life cycle of you have your creative phase, uh, you have the um, prototyping, production, finaling, you're getting ready to launch, you launch the game, and then um, you have some sort of life service or support. Or if you don't have that, you just move on to the next project. But really, the um, most value you get when you do this during the exploration phase. So when you um, are aware of your own cognitive biases, your own views and experiences, um, you can create empathy with your players. Um, if you do not have a diverse team, um, trying to get as many different voices um, to talk uh, and listen to so you um, get different perspectives and you're not just uh, you know following um, one feedback source because then you're just telling that person's story, but you're not making a game that appeals to everyone, which is also okay or can be okay, depending on the story you're trying to tell. Um, which also goes back to that we, what we don't want is that just becomes um, a tick box or a checkbox. So we can say, yes, we have a woman in the game, but there's a purpose um, because you're telling the story of that woman because there's depth um, to, and um, to, the character of the person, there's a background story, there are motivations for that character to be there. So um, it doesn't just become um, an inauthentic experience or just like something um, 
to just say, hey, look, we have a woman uh, in the game. For true transformation to happen, and that's probably both applies to our um, product and as well as our workplace, we need to not just focus on the obvious things that we can see here, like uh, skin color, race, gender, and age, but also on the things that are below the waterline uh, in this um, uh, iceberg, because these are the things that are often hidden or not um, immediately obvious because we are mostly just like thinking about the things we can see with our eyes. Um, so it's just like something to be aware of to that there's a lot more depth to consider as you're building out your stories and your and your worlds and stay open minded and curious um, show consideration to other cultures norms constraints <clears throat> be a risk, um, mindful of your own expectations which are often influenced by your own cultural background and context and uh, suspend your bias so you don't um, overlook any important risks for example or um, you know do something that is maybe well intended but uh, could be actually offensive to um, another culture for example or another um, country or cu uh, customs um, just a few examples for example we, we we talked at the beginning about how many women you know who are um, main characters um, often very often women are shown as support characters uh, often they are showed as uh, weak um, or distressed or in need of a rescue like the damsel in distress or black men are often shown as hyper masculine and aggressive um, or like from the hip hop culture which may lead to some people and you know sometimes younger people who are um, playing games and interacting with the world often through those social communities to think that all black men are like this or all women are like this um, and the problem here is that games and all media are a source of information for many. And it informs our vision or version of reality that is very likely and very often not an actual reflection of the reality. It's just a source of information, um, but even that false or inaccurate representation can shape a person's thoughts, feelings, behaviors towards that. So we risk the um, stereotypes would lead um, that we show in the game would lead people to believe that they are actually real uh, if they are more um, um, prone to be influenced, especially at a younger age. Um, one thing also to consider when we talk about gender, and I have uh, race and skin color here as well, um, it's also to consider things like clothing, tattoos, makeup, skin types, hair texture, skin conditions, um, someone's personality, background story, or the character's abilities. Um, I was talking with a developer actually here in Sweden where they said um, they're making uh, games for children, um, Toka Boka, and they were saying that they are trying to have, um, you know, not just different skin tones uh, in terms of color, but also different skin conditions for children, for example, who have um, um, like discoloration on their face. Um, I forgot the name in English for the uh, what it is called, but um, so that when a child plays that, they can say, ah, it's normal, it's normalized. They are, I, can, I can look like myself in the game or maybe even if other people would do that, um, it just normalizes the feeling of being different. Um, and, and I think that that really can make a huge difference in someone's um, difference in someone's life. So you don't feel as much um, as a minority, but there's more richer um, exchange between minority and majority um, cultures, which are often our um, creators of the game. And so to show you the um, current version, at least of our inclusion, inclusion framework uh, at EA that we're using, um, there are several resources that we um, activate in order to help, um, especially, you know, I was just looking at the uh, makeup of uh, our teams in Europe, uh, like in uh, Need for Speed and Battlefield. Um, the entire leadership team who's building the game is white male. Um, in Need for Speed, it's mostly white male English, um, and in 
um, battlefield is mostly white male Swedish with a couple of Scottish people in the leadership team. But um, there are no people of different ethnicities or genders even in the leadership team. Um, so how can we supplement that? Uh, A, by um, having a knowledge base, um, education, um, what I'm doing right now with you to just like raise uh, more awareness about um, how to think about these things, how to um, supplement maybe some of your, uh, or being more aware of your own biases uh, as well. And being aware of the players you are serving uh, or you want to serve. Um, there's a lot of uh, research we can do about what our players want, how they um, would feel more um, included. Um, if, for example, there is some toxicity or something that is deterring them from engaging with the game. And uh, um, guiding principles, which I will uh, talk about um, uh, as well. Uh, currently, we have four uh, guiding principles. Um, we have, uh, I call it here, an inclusion frame, uh, council, which is essentially a group of um, employees who get together who can uh, consult the game teams when they don't know where to go and how to approach this topic. And that's like for the entire uh, team of uh, EA Studios. And then a representation panel, which uh, has been very uh, useful for us. So in the absence of uh, some people like engaging directly with the community, because sometimes they are maybe uh, sensitive topics where um, it's easier to um, talk to our employees who are maybe some of uh, belong to those minority uh, cultures. So we have, I have the names here down uh, on the slide. So ERG stands for Employee Resource Group. And essentially that's a concept um, of um, like a special interest group in the end where people of the different um, minorities can gather and find a sense of belonging, find a sense of uh, community, talk about maybe some issues that they are experiencing, uh, support each other, but also do a lot of targeted, um, inspiring talks, um, raise more awareness about um, some of the issues they are facing and so on. So here we have Aspire, who's the uh, Asia um, Pacific Islander community at EA. Somos is the um, Hispanic Latin America uh, community. Then we have um, Women's Ultimate Team, which is, at the, as the name say, um, a place to gather with uh, for all women. Beat is for all um, Black Americans, African Americans, people from the Caribbean. I, I don't, I think BEAT stands for something, but I don't quite remember what it was. Um, Pride, uh, hopefully self-explanatory for the LGBTQ plus community. And then um, that's the old logo. We have a group called ABLE, which is looking after um, um, people of different uh, abilities. Um, and th this is, a lot of this is really focused on our employees and our workplace. Um, but this really sets the foundation for our employees and developers to engage with the topic of inclusive games in a more wholesome way because they are building the cultural foundation um, to be more open-minded and just be more alert about these topics, um, which makes my life uh, as the uh, director of inclusive product development at EA a lot easier because um, a lot of people are really engaged in this. Um, so I don't essentially have to um, um, convince people that it is something that they should be doing. Um, so I'll speed this up a little in this in the um, um, light of I want to talk a bit about a specific example um, that we had and then some uh, time for Q&A. So we have uh, the four guiding principles I was talking about, uh, which are um, questions that um, we highly recommend developers to consider in the um, exploration phase, such as, um, you know, as you are kind of thinking about the um, theme or the world uh, you're trying to create, like um, how often do we seek to tell stories of underrepresented people? So if you are a studio where um, all your protagonists have traditionally been white male, um, maybe that could be a point where you think, okay, so why are we doing this? Um, and is there maybe an interesting story we can tell about someone maybe um, like uh, Miles Morales, for example, he's a teenager and he's African-American. 
um, how often are we uh, put uh, or are we portraying people with diverse uh, uh, backgrounds authentically? If you have already made games before, um, and I mean, EA is a big company, we can even use these questions to do some research to say, um, are we actually, um, how many characters do we have in our games that are protagonists versus um, people in the background? Or are we portraying people authentically? Um, and you can do that by validating it with your community, by um, having panels where you are discussing that with your community. Um, are we imparting uh, unconscious bias into our narratives? So is it, um, are we stereotyping or caricaturing our characters because we are just like seeing uh, it from our own lens um, as someone who doesn't belong to that minority? Um, and do we have diversity and inclusion in the different stories we have or in the gameplay? Um, and what about our teams? Um, so I think that just like highlights and just like raises a lot more awareness um, to this. So Battlefield. Um, so as I mentioned, I have supported um, Battlefield um, 5, the Pacific. Um, I don't know if any of you have uh, played the Battlefield 5 or are familiar with this. So essentially Pacific um, was taking the uh, theater of war as it says to the Pacific in Battlefield V. So um, it sets in the World uh, War II era. And um, the goal was for the team to um, be culturally appropriate, respectful, and authentic about depicting the main Japanese protagonists, um, both in the game, but also in the uh, reveal trailer. Uh, and as you can remember, there was some uh, controversy about the Battlefield Five uh, reveal trailer. And what we said for this one is that we didn't want um, um, the trailer to distract from uh, how good the ex uh, um, expansion is in the, in, in the Pacific. So we wanted to be um, doing our extra due diligence to make sure that um, we are um, representing the soldiers in an authentic and respectful way. So how did we do that? Um, what we did essentially is to uh, assemble a small team uh, with some of employees across EA from those uh, employee resource groups I mentioned who came from uh, Korea and Japan. And we showed them just a storyboard. And we said, here's the story. Here's what we want uh, in the trailer uh, to be shown. Um, what do you think? And one of the... Uh, example like the uh, katana um, that the uh, soldier is holding um, in the storyboard he was supposed to throw it in the mud and then have a fist fight with the uh, uh, american soldier and um, the feedback was that you know for especially for a soldier this is like um, they would never throw a, this weapon which is so precious to them uh, in the dirt so why would he do that um, and that was a good point that we hadn't considered. So we were um, able to really early on change um, how the trailer was evolving just by talking through the text and the intent and the um, um, images um, which were drawn by hand that people could see. Um, so we were saving a lot of production cost in the end because we were doing a lot of these things early on. Um, another example was when um, at the end of the trailer, it was supposed to end with an image of Iwo Jima uh, with the American uh, soldiers, if you um, are familiar with the statue. But then we thought that makes the uh, Japanese look like uh, they have been defeated when this battlefield, it's a game, it's a war fantasy, and we are not replaying accurate history. In, in the end, the Japanese soldiers could win the war because it's a war fantasy that you are replaying. Um, it's not um, the authentic story of the of the war in the Pacific. So what we said is um, we kill both um, the American soldier and the Japanese soldier in the end, um, which was, um, I, I think, if you watch the trailer, and I don't think I have it here, but it's quite a powerful ending because it just shows that, um, you know, how, how hard war is and there's no winner uh, in a war. Um, we also included some cultural consultants where um, there's like uh, a few of them, which is actually a job, um, which is also part of my job, 
Um, there's a woman which I can recommend um, to Google. Uh, her name is Kate Edwards, uh, and she has her own company called Geography. Um, and she's like very outspoken about these things. And she's worked with a lot of companies um, uh, at Ubisoft, Activision, uh, and also with EA um, to consult, um, just to have an extra pair of eyes. Because while we are listening to our uh, employees from different cultural backgrounds, um, we don't just want to listen to one source of feedback, but it's good to validate it from external uh, as well. So we engaged with her and she uh, gave us essentially the same uh, feedback. Uh, another thing um, we did is track all the feedback that we collected. Um, and we gave that uh, Excel sheet uh, to QA to say, as you are playing the game, please make sure that um, none of the things that we flagged uh, and that we found a resolution for are still anywhere in the game, just to create a whole some holistic um, experience. Um, so that entire process worked really well. And now that I'm in this full-time position, which is a brand new position that was created uh, at EA in September, actually, uh, so I'm doing this full-time now, um, is that we want to uh, take some of the lessons learned from all the different projects uh, and create um, a version two and an evolution of the framework that I just showed um, to support our game teams in a more structured way. Um, and uh, with that, I'm pretty much at the end.